This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Question. How did an anthropomorphic stack of tires end up as the global authority on fine dining? Yes, the Michelin Guide that famously assigns one to three stars to only the finest and snootiest of restaurants all around the world. This is made by the same people who make tires. Oh, I'm sorry, Brits. By tire, of course, I mean tire. Michelin is Michelin. Though I will be switching between the French and American pronunciations for the purposes of rhetoric and humor, Michelin and Michelin are the same company. This is funny because when most of us today think about car tires, we think of the blue-collar automotive repair and maintenance services industry. Honest and essential, but low status. In contrast, the kind of restaurant deemed worthy of a single Michelin star, let alone three, is generally a haunt of the elite international business class. The global aristocracy eats here, and man, do they pay for it. The kind of people whom I imagine eat at these places? The closest they ever get to a tire is when they reach their hand out of the window of their Peugeot to tip the valet. So again, how did the inedible rubber cousin of the Pillsbury Doughboy end up telling the bourgeoisie where to dine. Well, we have to go back, way back before the automobile became a mere utilitarian object, ubiquitous across all classes in developed countries. Indeed, you could say that cars are really tools of the lower classes these days, since the super-rich can afford to live in ultra-dense urban centers like Manhattan, where they have everything they need at their fingertips and great public transportation. The rest of the normals out there don't have that, so they have to drive cars. In the late 19th century, there were just a few hundred automobiles in all of France. This is according to historian Herbert Lotman, author of The Michelin Men, Driving an Empire. Lotman writes these early Utus remained rich men's toys, unable to stray very far from the vicinity of a reliable repair shop. Even if it didn't break down all the time, you would be a fool to drive your voiture very far from your maison. Even if you got where you were going, there's no guarantee someone would be selling petrol there for you to get back home. There's no guarantee you would find where you were going because there was no numbering system for French roads and maps were kind of unreliable. Oh, and get this, if you blow a tire, you're gonna be stuck on the side of the road for at least a day. This is because the first generation of pneumatic tires were glued to the wheel rim. To replace the tire, you'd have to glue on a new one and let it dry overnight. This is until French brothers Edouard and André Michelin came up with the basic design everybody still uses to this day, where the tire is held in place by tension, not glue. The Michelin brothers were heirs to a family farm equipment factory, and their first tires were for bicycles, not cars. The younger brother, Edouard, he actually ran the factory out in the provinces. The older brother, André, he stayed in Paris and handled marketing and public relations, at which he was a stone-cold genius. Today, André Michelin is hailed as a pioneer of indirect marketing. He understood that the market for Michelin tires would be tiny until rubber-wheeled-based transportation became way more practical and enjoyable and accessible to the masses. Michelin is very much the French counterpart of the American industrialist Henry Ford. These are men who fully believed that if they could just advance mass production along with mass consumption, well, then they could make everybody rich, especially themselves. And I suppose they were right. From here on, I'm drawing heavily from this book by American historian Stephen Harp, Making Michelin, Advertising and Cultural Identity in 20th Century France. The Michelin brothers did a number of things to promote the automobile lifestyle in France, and thereby stimulate demand for their product. They sponsored races, which were inevitably won by the vehicles with Michelin tires, because Michelin tires were legit way better than their earliest competitors. When Michelin got into the airplane business, they offered prizes for various feats of early aviation. They promoted a national road numbering system in France. They made better maps, and they still make maps to this day. And they made the Michelin Guide, the first edition of which published in 1900. They gave it out for free. It was a list of all of the establishments in France that a motorist might need. Repair shops, petrol stations, hotels, and 
restaurants. The growth of this new automobile lifestyle in France was very much interrelated with the growth of gastronomy in France and the birth of the French restaurant industry, which is really the birth of the Western restaurant industry. That's a history we'll talk more about another day, but it all has roots in the French Revolution. The notion that the common man could ennoble himself by accessing and learning to appreciate the finer things in life things that had previously been reserved for the hereditary aristocracy. A noble table embiggens the smallest man. That promise of the early restaurant industry is very much the same promise of the automobile industry, that it was going to empower the common man to become his own lord, to get behind the wheel of his own life. It is, of course, ironic that this dream of industrial egalitarianism in France was built upon the subjugation of people in French colonies, like Vietnam, where they grew the rubber trees for the tires. But anyway, as Stephen Harp observes in his book, Michelin tires quickly lost their competitive advantages in the early 20th century. From the UK came Dunlop tires. I apparently have Dunlop tires myself. From the US came Goodyear and Goodrich and Firestone tires. But Michelin was able to maintain its position in the French market by making itself a symbol of French nationalism. And indeed, more than a symbol, an instrument of French nationalism. Michelin became the number one funder of the natalist movement in France, which tried to persuade French women to have more babies, make more Frenchmen. And the guide itself became an instrument of nationalism because it empowered and encouraged Parisians to go out, venture forth into the provinces. And Michelin's promotion of French gastronomy was also an instrument of nationalism. France had come to define itself as the Western capital of fine food and drink. California had the movie industry, France had the restaurant industry, and the guide became the Academy Awards of cooking. To the uninitiated, one star might seem like a terrible review, until you learn that the vast majority of eating establishments get absolutely zero stars. Even really great places get zero stars. In recent editions, Michelin has tried to introduce non-star designations to recognize places that have awesome food, but they don't rise to the level of Michelin-starred cuisine, which is generally super fancy and super fussy. In publishing guides for places beyond France, Michelin became an instrument of French imperialism, judging restaurants in New York and Tokyo by the standards of French fine dining, thereby influencing chefs all around the world to internalize those French standards. Check this out. This is the most recent edition of a Michelin guide. And in the preface where they explain their methodology, they reassure you, dear reader, that their highest awards are considered at a European level level. This, of course, implies that restaurants outside of Europe are inherently inferior, and they would need to be graded on a curve in order to come in anywhere close to the European restaurants. In fact, Michelin currently awards its maximum of three stars to about 30 restaurants in France, but only 13 in the United States and three in China. These are countries far larger than France and countries where I assure you there is no shortage of good stuff to eat. Now, in fairness to Michelin, they do not claim to review every single high-level restaurant in a place like China, as they do in Western European countries. Here in the States, Michelin only reviews restaurants in New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and California. And there is definitely Michelin-star-level food happening in Portland and New Orleans and Boston, but Michelin isn't even trying to review it yet. As a result, the Michelin Guide is not nearly as influential and famous here in the States as it is in Europe. Maybe it is in New York, but overall, I would say that the real Oscars of cooking in the United States are the James Beard Awards, even though the James Beard Awards go to chefs, not to restaurants, and that is a meaningful distinction. But anyway, all of that explains why the tire guy is the European arbiter of fine dining. Whether you're chasing Michelin stars or not, Squarespace can certainly help you get your restaurant or any other business out there and on the internet. Grab a website template, replace their sexy food pictures with yours, and start typing in your menu. It's as simple as that. You can drop in an open table block for reservations, or you can use Talk, the all-in-one reservation system that lets you manage reservations, event tickets, takeout and delivery, all from one interface in your Squarespace site. 
Of course, if you just need to let clients make simple appointments on your website, they have schedulers for that too, you can just drop in. You don't have to know exactly what you want because you can start building a website for free anytime at squarespace.com. But when you're ready to pay Squarespace to host the site for you on the internet or to register your custom domain, use my code Ragusia, you'll save 10%. That's three star service if I've ever seen it. Thank you, Squarespace. And thank you, Michelin Brothers. Do I actually want to thank them? Do I actually think that this has been a net good on the culinary world?